Welcome, Westover Hills. We are so glad you're all here tonight. Yeah, give it up for yourselves. Y'all are awesome. My name is Pastor Tito. I'm the high school and young adults pastor here, and we are excited to be uh, at, towards the end of a sermon series that we've been doing all month called Stronger Families. And tonight we wanted to zero in on a topic called Constructive Conflict, aka how to fight fair. But first, I just want to take a moment and wish happy anniversary to my mom and dad. So yeah, you can give it up for my parents. They got married on leap year to save money because my dad's a genius. And technically, they've only been married eight years. So, so to open up, wanted to share kind of some deep thoughts on love from kids. Uh, so here we go. How do you decide whom to marry? This is Alan, age 10. He says, you got to find someone who likes the same stuff. Like if you like sports, they should like it that you like sports. And she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> Kristen, age 10, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before, and you get to find out later who you're stuck with. <laughs> that was a good one. How can a stranger tell if two people are married? You might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. Derek, age 8, how would the world be different if people didn't get married? There sure would be a lot of kids to explain, wouldn't there? Kelvin, age 8. And then how would you make a marriage work? Tell your wife that she looks pretty even if she looks like a dump truck. Ricky, <laughs> age 10. That's a lot of wisdom. And, you know, there are a lot of common pre-marriage myths out there. Many of these myths, they sound smart, but unintentionally they're misguided or they're ill-informed. And this tends to be where many young adults where many high schoolers tend to trip up when they get really serious about dating someone. We expect exactly the same things from marriage. Everything good in our relationship will get better. We believe that. We, some of those myths are everything bad in our lives will just disappear and just go bye-bye. Or we believe that our spouse will make us whole. And for some of our married folks in the room, you're like, yeah, I figured that one out pretty quick. Or here's one, uh, married, many married couples may believe common marriage myths as well, such as if we have conflict in our marriage, we're not good enough to serve in ministry. Another marriage myth, our marriage problems are all my spouse's fault. Some of you are like, they are. <laughs> or they're all my fault. Another marriage myth, a divorce will make me happy. Another marriage myth, I married the wrong person. Author Gary Thomas says it like this, a good marriage is not something you find, it's something you work for. And as we talk today, our goal is to hopefully dispel some of these myths, but ultimately to give you the tools that you need to build a stronger family and to learn to fight fair. And many of these principles can be applied from teenager to parent, or from older sibling to younger sibling, or from mother to son. And so keep that in mind as we're doing this talk. And just to give you some research, some of the great books that I used when compiling this message, you'll see at the bottom of the app. They're Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, Sacred Marriage, and Marriage Done Right. So to start off with, why is fighting fair such a big deal? Because the inability to fight fair impacts marriages. In the 1930s, one out of every seven marriages ended in divorce. In the 1960s, one out of every four marriages ended in divorce. From 2000 and onward, between one-third and one out of every two marriages ended in divorce. That's between 43 and 45 percent. And of divorced couples, listen, only 20 percent said that they believed that they were happier after they divorced. But even so, marriages that can't fight fair also impact their kids in a huge way. For as resilient as we say kids are, look at what happens when a dad removes himself from the picture and leaves home. One out of three of all children in the U.S. live apart from their fathers. That's 24 million children right now who don't have dads at home. And of those 24 million children, 44% of them are living in poverty. 
90% of all homeless and runaway children fatherless. 71% of all high school dropouts fatherless. 85% of all youth in prison fatherless. And as a result, boys raised in fatherless homes are twice as likely to commit a crime. Boys raised in step families are two and a half times more likely to commit a crime than those raised by both of their biological parents. Girls raised without dads at home are four times, four times more likely to be sexually active at an early age and twice as likely to get pregnant early. Friends, this is why our church is so adamant about building strong men and about building strong families. You see, it's not just a tagline. It's a heartbeat. Because we realize that if we as men can stand in the gap, that God has better for our families. That if we as a family will do what it takes to grow as a family and draw closer to Jesus, that God can do things in your marriage that you didn't even dream were possible. So please lean in. Whether you're new to this whole marriage thing or whether you've been married before, whether you're a grandparent and you've been married decades, whether you're a marriage pro and every day feels like your honeymoon, as Instagram can attest to, or whether you're engaged and you're living in the thrill of getting to use one of those guns and going to Target and scanning your whole life away for your registry, or whether you're dating somebody way above your head, some of you are like, yeah, that's me. Or whether you're on the other side of the spectrum and you're the one dating someone way below your standards. <laughs> or maybe you're here and you're just single and you are ready to mingle, hallelujah. But wherever you're on the spectrum, that's you. Just look around, y'all. This is a great, anyway, I'll keep moving forward. <laughs> this isn't married people talk. This is just real talk. It's just real talk. Did you know that the average wedding today costs $35,329, according to the not.com. That's photographers, that's videographers, that's the venue, that's decor, that's the wedding dress, that's the honeymoon, that's the tuxes, all that. And today, many couples spend the majority of their time, energy, and resources preparing for one big day, but relatively nothing on preparing for the lifetime of days that follow. Think about that for a minute. Statistically, they say less than one out of five couples start their marriage with any kind of premarital counseling. And likely as a result, more than 200,000 new marriages end each year prior to the couple's second anniversary. So here's where we come in. We want to teach you how to win in relationships, how to win with your family. And to do this, I think it's important that we recognize that a healthy relationship is built on three key areas. There's passion, intimacy, and commitment. Passion. This is the, the hot in marriage. This is the one that doesn't need a whole lot of explaining. Most young couples have tons of this, and it's awkward when you see them. This is dating each other. This is holding hands. This is giving compliments and beyond. I remember when I was in my early to mid-20s, I would say prayers like this. I would be like, dear Jesus, I love you. I love you so much. You know I do. But if you would please, please, please don't come back until I find my wife and until we've at least been married for a couple weeks, please. <laughs> right? Some of you think I'm joking. Like this is for real, Pastor Tito here. And here's the thing that all the married folks in the room already know that my youth pastor told me. He said, if you're getting married just for the sex, it's like buying an airplane just for the peanuts. <laughs> right? There is much, much, much more to a good marriage than just passion. There's intimacy. And if passion is the hot, then intimacy is the warm in the relationship. Without intimacy, a couple can be isolated and alone even while living under the same roof. Because love must be fed and nurtured, and what feeds and nurtures it is time. The best marriages are built on a solid friendship. It's where you don't just love the person, but you like them too, and you enjoy spending time with them, and it's accepting them for who they are, and it's not believing you have the power and the responsibility to change them, but you give them permission to just be who they are and love them for it. 
I love this quote by John Fisher. It says, the success of a marriage comes not in finding the right person, but in the ability of both partners to adjust to the real person. They inevitably realize they've married. And then there's commitment. Commitment is the cold in the marriage. Commitment is the mortar that holds the stones of marriage in place. This is the Jason Mraz, I won't give up on us. You know what I'm saying? It's where, it's where you bite your lip and you dig your heels in the ground and you just keep fighting for the marriage until one of you meets Jesus. <laughs> Hear me, friends. So of you like, I've been there. I got the t-shirt. And your spouse, listen, listen. Hear me, friends. Your spouse needs to know that you're not going to leave them. Your spouse needs to know that no matter how hard you fight, that at the end of the argument, you're not leaving, that you're not going anywhere, that they can have the security of knowing that it's okay to have conflict and that you're going to be there when it's done. Listen to this quote. It says, here's the stuff of which fairy tales are made, the prince and princess on their wedding day. But fairy tales usually end at this point with the simple phrase, they lived happily ever after. This may be because fairy tales regard marriage as an anticlimax after the romance of courtship. This is not the Christian view. Our faith sees the wedding day not as a place of arrival, but the place where the adventure begins. This is Robert Runcie, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He spoke these words to Prince Charles and Princess Diana on their wedding day. God gives us his example. And his example is he calls Jesus the groom and he calls the church his bride. And our marriages are meant to remind us as a means of foreshadowing what our relationship with God should and could look like. I've heard stories of couples who one spouse after 20 years of marriage becomes racked with some debilitating disease. Hospital bound, unable to feed themselves, losing control of their own bodily functions. And there comes a point where the healthy spouse begins to realize that their main goal in marriage cannot be their own happiness. There's something inside them that has to decide to love. To choose to love when it's hard, that still chooses to stay committed to that person. Why? Because love is not an emotion. It's a decision. Because God wants to use your marriage to show you and to show others what it could look like to have a committed and passionate and intimate relationship. Because marriage's primary function is not to make us happy, it's to make us holy. I heard it said this way, love is like a tennis match. You'll never win consistently until you learn to serve well. But the problem is there are huge barriers to having healthy marriages, to having healthy friendships, to having healthy relationships, even within our family structure. We are all selfish by nature. For instance, when you have a bad day, it's usually because something affected you, not because something affected some other person, right? Or when you say your wedding vows, there isn't a clause in there that says, I promise I vow to feed myself only really good food. I promise to watch all my favorite shows on Netflix, right? There's no such clause. When you're in a group picture, the way you determine if it's a good group picture is how good you look in the picture. Can I get an amen, right? And not only are we all selfish creatures, and this is a barrier to, to a good relationship, but also we cannot change anyone else. Only God can change hearts. And this is a huge one because so many of us want to be Superman, or Wonder Woman, and we want to parachute in, and we want to come to the rescue of this damsel in distress and change them and show them the light. But only God can change hearts. And if we're honest, it's hard enough to change our own hearts and our own minds. If you've ever been heartbroken, it's really hard to get over it and, and not care anymore. If you've ever felt betrayed, it's really hard to tell that person, I forgive you, and to move on in your heart. And if it's this hard to change ourselves, how impossible is it for us to assume that we can change someone else? Friends, we can't. Only God can. And he does. In fact, he's a boss at it. 
In fact, it's his specialty. Listen to Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I love this scripture. It says, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. Some of you needed to hear that today. That God is still in the miracle working business. That God still loves you and cares for you and he still cares for your situation and he still cares for your relationships and he still cares for what's going on in your lives. We can't, but he can. And another one of those huge barriers that we face is we have tons of unspoken expectations. Marriage isn't some kind of osmosis where we automatically know what the other person's thinking. And if you've been married more than 24 hours, you know that all too well. This is why communicating is so important because expectations are a huge deal. For instance, I expect her to iron all my clothes every morning like my mom did. Or I expect him to fix everything once it breaks without me having to tell him like my dad did. Or I expect her to have dinner ready when I get home like my mom did. Or I expect him to just know when he said something that hurt me. Or I expect her to give me space to think after an argument. And so here are some things not to do when trying to resolve conflict and fight fair. Psychologists and counselors refer to the following list as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? I'm like, wow, that's really dreary, okay, when it comes to communication. And the idea is that these are such a red flag when you argue with somebody, whether it be a best friend, whether it be a girlfriend, whether it be a spouse, et cetera, et cetera, danger is imminent because after each horseman arrives, he paves the way for the next. And in fact, some psychologists say they can predict with 80% accuracy who will be divorced six or seven years after marrying based not on whether a couple argues, but off of how a couple argues. The first horseman is criticism. Criticism is attacking somebody's personality rather than their behavior. Criticism ensures that the other person feels blamed, accused, and put on blast. For example, you drive me crazy. You never ask my opinion when you decide something important. Criticism. Criticism is how we say in in Espanol, no bueno. The alternative is complaining. Complaining is a negative comment about something that you wish were different versus criticism is about someone that you wish was different. Complaining is normal and necessary in any relationship to help make it stronger in the long run. So instead of, you drive me crazy, you never ask my opinion when you decide something important, instead try, I feel hurt and neglected when you don't ask my opinion. Notice this, criticism usually begins with you and complaints usually begin with I. Here's another example. You try to make me feel stupid by always correcting everything that I say. Criticism versus I feel very put down when you correct the things that I say in public. You hear the difference there? It's subtle, but one evokes empathy and one evokes understanding in the hearer and the other one just causes defensiveness. It makes you want to put your gloves on. The second horseman is contempt. This is the intention to insult or psychologically abuse your partner and it's aimed right at the heart and causes the person pain. This includes name calling, Hostile humor that attacks who they are, mockery. For instance, hey, genius, right? I, fir- I used to think that was a compliment. I'm like, well, thanks. <laughs> or hey, four eyes, hey, scraggly beard, hey, big teeth. You're like, man, Pastor Tio's got some issues he's working through, right? <laughs> when I was a school teacher, I had this kindergarten girl come up to me and say, Pastor Tito, you smile like a horse. I'm like, thanks, honey. <laughs> I love you too go sit down. (laughs) Defensiveness. Some of you are like, I see it now. (laughs) Defensiveness. This is the third horseman. This is when neither person is willing to take responsibility for setting things right. So both defend themselves. This tends to escalate conflicts rather than resolving them. I love this quote. It says, it is difficult not only to say the right thing in the right place, but it's far more difficult to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. George Sala, stonewalling. This is the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. This is when you just give up. 
You're tired of reacting. Your emotions are through the roof. You're overwhelmed, so you withdraw. Usually men, this tends to be how we respond. We withdraw. We, we have this blank look. We avoid eye contact. We avoid nodding our heads or even making sounds. And it conveys as much disapproval and as much distance as we can possibly convey. But here's what you already know. You can win the argument and still not win. You can win the argument and still not win. And according to counselors, if you tend to move up this scale whenever you and your partner or your best friend or whomever fights, then your relationship is already on very shaky ground. And then some of us, when fighting, we live on a different scale, especially those of us who are a little more passive-aggressive, people-pleasing, non-confrontational in nature. But these are also unhealthy means of arguing, placating. That's, yes, honey, <laughs> whatever you want. These are the peacemakers who never speak their minds. And the problem is, problems that you bottle up tend to boil up over time. Then there's distracting. These people, they avoid direct eye contact. They avoid direct answers, and they're quick to change the subject just so they don't get in a fight. And they'll say things like, well, what problem? Hey, let's go shopping. Squirrel, right? And, and they just, like, jump around like that. And even though ignoring problems may be the easiest... It will cause bitterness, resentment, and false peace over the long haul. It acts as a cancer that erodes the passion, intimacy, and commitment of a relationship. Mature adults realize that every relationship involves conflict, confession, and forgiveness. The absence of conflict demonstrates that either the relationship isn't important enough to fight over or that both individuals are too insecure to risk disagreement. Listen to this quote. I love this quote by Gary and Betsy. It says, Our Lord has sovereignly ordained that a refining process take place as we go through difficulties, not around them. Through the desert, through the Red Sea, through the fiery furnace, and ultimately through the cross, God doesn't protect Christians from their problems. He helps them walk victoriously through their problems. Amen? He is so good that he gives us the strength to walk through our problems. Now, here are the opposite of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We call this the six criteria of healthy marriages. Number one, high levels of friendship, respect, affection, and humor. Number two, a ratio of five to one or better for positive to negative interactions. In other words, you're getting five more compliments than you're getting anything ne negative. He's, he's telling you how pretty you look. She's telling you how handsome you look in that shirt. Thank you. Thanks, honey. <laughs> Successful bids for attention. This one is, hey, honey, check this out. And they actually stop what they're doing and they pay attention. They turn off the TV at dinner time. They leave their phones plugged in in another room just so you can connect when you're together. Number four criteria of healthy marriage is soft starts at, argument, at disagreements instead of hard, heavy starts. Number five, the husband accepts influence from his wife. <laughs> it, in other words, it isn't always his way or the highway, or vice versa. Each partner allows the other to speak into the situation, and potentially they'll change their own mind. Number six, respect for each other's needs, likes, dislikes, and inner life. And here's what many of you already know. Good communication requires warmth. Good communication requires unconditional acceptance. Rather than evaluating or requiring change, you simply accept the thoughts, feelings, and actions of the other person, giving them permission to be who they are. Because, friends, we are acceptance magnets. We are repelled by rejection. Think about when you were a teenager, just for a moment. Some of you, you maybe you hung out with the wrong crowd. Maybe you spent time with people that you shouldn't have. But one thing you could honestly say is that whomever it was that got your attention and got your friendship, those were the people that you felt accepted by. Those were the people that you felt like even when it wasn't safe to go home, you could go to them about anything and just be who you are. And then there's genuineness. Good communication requires genuineness. And this is so much more than words. This is how you say what you say. I thought this was so interesting. Parents, tune into this. It says, your nonverbal body language 
posture, and facial expressions account for 58% of how your message is interpreted. Your tone of voice accounts for 35% of how your message is received, and your actual words only account for 7% of what you say. Some of you have gotten in trouble this week because of this. (laughs) Students, think about it. When you say the right thing to your teacher or your girlfriend or to one of your parents, yeah, yeah, that dress, that doesn't make you look fat at all. (laughs) But you still get in trouble? And then there's empathy. Empathy is feeling what someone else feels. Because the people around you, they don't perceive things the same way you do. No one sees how you see, so you have to put yourself in their shoes. Because loving with your heart alone is sympathizing. Loving with your head alone is analyzing. But loving with your heart and your head in tandem, that is empathizing. How do you fight a clean fight? Successful relationships fight clean fights without leaving scars. Number one, choose your battles carefully. Chances are 90% of the problems you bicker about can be overlooked. So don't sweat the small stuff. Maybe your partner is just different than you, and that's just who they are. Is it worth fighting over that they always put the toilet paper the wrong way back on the roll? Is it worth fighting over that they always squeeze the toothpaste in the wrong place? Don't they know the Bible says to squeeze it from the bottom? (laughs) My goodness. Not my wife, though. I'm actually the one who does it the wrong way. Number two, practice reflective listening. The Lord gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listening involves interacting and reflecting the message back to the sender. It requires us to be less focused on what we're going to say and more focused on what they're saying right now. The purpose is to let the other person know that you heard what they said and that you understand what they're saying. Listen how the brother of Jesus said it in James chapter 1, verse 19. He said, be quick to listen slow to speak. Number three, to find the issue clearly. When you feel the tension rising, ask each other to define clearly what you're really fighting about until you both understand the issue. Because arguments become habitual if the source of the conflict is never identified. What's the real source of disagreement? Why are we really fighting? Number four, understand and accept the differences between men and women. In conversations, women tend to share their feelings, and men tend to solve problems. And so many arguments that we get into could potentially be solved if we were to identify our conversation ahead of time. For instance, hey, honey, this is about to be a feeling talk, so don't you try to solve the problem. Just listen. Now, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I'm pretty clueless about these kind of things. Like, I appreciate when someone throws me a line every once in a while. And then, number five, forgive and apologize when necessary. Hmm. When and how do you apologize? Does one of you apologize more than the other person? Do you use your apologies to short-circuit issues? In other words, do you cut short an argument with a hasty apology? Like, I said I was sorry for what I did. Now why can't you forget about it and move on? This form of apology, this, my friends, is a tool of manipulation. It's a way of getting off the hook for the real issue. And a premature apology blocks real change. I'm sorry for snapping at you, but look, you have to understand that I've been under a lot of stress lately. That's very different than, I'm sorry. It wasn't right for me to lash out at you when I'm stressed. An apology is a means of holding yourself accountable for your own actions. Otherwise, your apology is just a verbal backhand to the face. And as we wrap up, listen, friends. You need to remember that our God is in the business of changing lives. Many of us, we've been fighting unfair for too long. And it's time to turn to God and let him change our hearts. Many of us in this room, we've wounded our spouses, we've hurt our kids, we've damaged our closest relationships, 
and it's time to repent. Because we tend to treat the ones we love worse than we treat just about anyone else. Let's repent tonight. If you'll bow your heads, if you'll close your eyes. Some of us need to be reminded that God can resuscitate a relationship that's as good as dead. That our God can restore passion, intimacy, commitment to rebuild what harsh words and memories have broken down as our prayer team joins us up front. Listen to Colossians chapter 3. These are the words of Paul, a follower of Jesus in the first century who used to hate Christians, who used to believe that everything about Christianity was a lie and was false. And even in his life, God was able to change him. His heart was as good as dead towards Jesus. But here's what he said in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. He says, since God shows you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. And remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. For a long time, I used to struggle with this concept. There's a story in the Bible of, of this woman who, who comes into this room where Jesus is having dinner. And Jesus is just eating. He's just reclining. He's just being himself. And this woman rushes in, and she breaks this alabaster jar of expensive perfume on his feet. And you know the story. She begins wiping it with her hair. And the people in the room begin to talk. You know how they do. They begin to talk. And at one point, Jesus brings their attention and says, now do you think she's been forgiven for little? Or do you think she's been forgiven for much? I said, well, probably a whole lot, Jesus, if she's crying like that. And he, here's the idea. Some of us forget how much we've been forgiven of. We can't forgive anybody else because we, we hold on to the bitterness and the anger and we forget that it was our sins that crucified our Savior to a cross. Yes, I, I'm not trying to belittle what he said to you. I'm not trying to belittle what she did to you. I'm not trying to belittle what your parents said about you or that teacher or, or that friend that's no longer a friend. But don't miss this. We are a people who have been forgiven much. And because he has forgiven us so much, we can turn around and forgive others. And if that's you in this place, if that's you, and you would say, I need to forgive somebody, if you would just stand up where you are, start making your way to this altar, or maybe you're here and you're the one who needs to forgive yourself for something that you've done. You said hurtful words to your spouse. Maybe you're in a fight with your best friend or your girlfriend, or maybe you bruised and hurt your kids in a deep, deep way, and you haven't talked to them for who knows how long. Man, if that's you, we would love for you to join us as we pray, as we put an arm around your neck and just trust Jesus, because our God can resuscitate a relationship that's as good as dead. If we could, let's approach the throne of God together. If we could stand all around this room, all around this room. And if we could just stretch forward our hands to our brothers and sisters up here. And let's just begin interceding for them. Let's just begin believing for them. Friends, there are people watching at home right now. Let's begin praying for them. You're not alone. There are people in this room that are praying for you. Come on, right now, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come on, pray as if it were your son or daughter down here. Pray as if it were your best friend down here. Pray as if it were your broken wife watching on a computer screen tonight. Lord, we love you, 
God, we trust you. We trust you. Jesus. Jesus. Matthew 7, 8 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. God, so we're going to knock. We're going to seek. We're going to ask. God, break down the walls in our hearts. Help us to forgive those who don't deserve forgiveness. That uncle, that grandparent, that teacher, that ex wife, that ex-husband that said nobody would ever love you again, that said you don't deserve to be happy. My God, right now, right now, right now, with all the empathy we can muster, God, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters. God, that you would begin opening up their hearts and doing just like you said in Ezekiel 36, that you begin giving a new heart and putting a new spirit in them and that you would remove from them the heart of stone and that you would give them a heart of flesh. God, right now, right now in your body, in your people, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for what you're doing all around this room. And for those in the room who you thought, man, I, I just wish I would have come down. That's okay. God can touch you from your seat. God can touch you right where you're standing. He's big enough. If we could as a family, if we'd all just throw our hands up in the air right now and begin seeking after our Savior, God, that you would move on our hearts. God, that you would expose anything inside of us that we need to ask somebody else to forgive us for. God, that you would draw us near to you. God, that you would help us to fight fair. That, that when, we have, when we have fights, when we have conflict, that it would be constructive. God, that you would use us to build stronger families. God, we cry out for you. We cry out for you to do what only you can do. Matthew 7, 11 says it like this. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? If you need healing, He is a good Father and He wants to give that to you. If you need forgiveness, He is a good Father and He won't hold that against you anymore. If you need a second chance, listen, our God is a God of second chances. Around here, we call it making new. And he does it every day, every day. Father, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. God, that you would save lives, that you would heal hearts. In the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus.